Dolly 2. It's OpenAI's new model that can do image generation and a whole lot more at a crazy level of quality. And hopefully, although I'm a little bit late to the party on this, I think I can still give you a fresh take. In this video, I specifically want to talk about what Dolly 2 does and how it works in the context of and in comparison to the original Dolly paper that came out a bit over a year ago. I want to break down the differences, the similarities, and how this type of image generation has really evolved over the past year. After we get through all of that about what's in this paper and how Dolly 2 works, then we'll wrap up with some of my thoughts and take a look over a few of the new images coming out of Dolly 2 for the fun. Of it. To get us started, I want to give you a high-level overview of how the original Dolly, Dolly 1 work, to set the stage and to give you context for this new work. So let's go over what Dolly 1 did. It started with a discrete variational autoencoder, or DVAE for short, to compress images into tokens. A DVAE is trained with one in encoder part that compresses the image, a two quantization step that turns the continuous embeddings into discrete ones, or oftentimes these are now called image tokens, and three, a decoder that reconstructs the original image from the image tokens. After that DVAE is trained, the next step is to take text image pairs, so images and then captions describing those images, and concatenate the text tokens with the generated image tokens. These arrays of tokens are then trained autoregressively using a 12 billion parameter GPT-3 model. When I say training autoregressively, that essentially just means the model is predicting its own inputs. So for example, here in this case, that might mean that the image tokens are masked out or that the model can't see them, and then the model would have to predict them starting from just the text tokens. That process can be used to generate the image tokens, but in the last step, we still need to go from image tokens to an actual image. From here, the paper actually isn't super clear, but I'm guessing they just get images by passing the predicted image tokens through the original DVAE encoder. They do that for 512 images and then choose the best one based on some separate contrastive learning model. So that's how Dolly 1 works. And this paper is similar to that, especially at a high level, but it changes all the parts and details. So let's jump into the paper and talk about that. Looking at the new Dolly paper now, we can see an overview of how the training of Dolly 2 actually works. The dotted line here denotes a separation between the two phases of training. The first step uses clip to train a joint embedding space between captions and images. What that means is that they take caption image pairs and train the embeddings for an image and a matching caption to have a very similar embedding. So for example here, the text a corgi playing a flame throwing trumpet and an image of that exact thing should have very similar embeddings. This is very helpful for reasons we will get into, but because this isn't new, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. OpenAI already has a whole blog post and I think a paper about it too. If you're interested, you can check that out for more details. It is pretty neat. As I mentioned, I wanted to show you how this method has somewhat evolved from the original Dolly. And this is the first place where we see that similarity. This is similar to the original paper in that they are compressing images in into a latent space, but here they're doing it with clip instead of a DVAE. And one of the benefits of using clip over a DVAE is that now they can do the same embedding process with text and into a semantically similar latent space as the images. Once clip is trained, the next step is to go from text embeddings to image priors. And that is essentially the latent vector that is supposed to be a compressed encoding of the image. Remember in Dolly 1, they used an autoregressive model to achieve this. Here here, they try a very similar autoregressive method and also something else, but we'll get into the details of that later. The big difference that I want to talk about is after that. Once they've generated that image prior, instead of decoding it with a DVAE, which they are no longer using, they use a diffusion model. We will get into what exactly a diffusion model is, but as you can see from these sample images, this works much better. Part of the reason for this huge improvement is due to this improvement in the decoder method. As it turns out, when you're dealing with generator-based models, it seems to me at least that the decoder is much more important than anything else. To give you an idea of why, look at this panda example where the prompt is P 
Panda Mad Scientist Mixing Sparkling Chemicals Art Station. There are a million different images that you could imagine from this prompt, but if the output looks, well, like shit, I'm not going to care if the context is kind of right. Even before you worry about the prompt, there is a lot to learn about how to generate images, from simple shapes to making sure shadows align correctly to how different types of art styles look. So using this diffusion-based decoder, Dolly 2 can generate these impressive images. As a quick aside, if you like this type of ML content, which I do a lot of on this channel, but you aren't subscribed, consider subscribing and hitting the bell icon. I run a small channel here, so it really means a lot to me and it certainly helps out a lot. So anyway, that diffusion part is the main difference here. So coming up, I wanna go into more details into this training process, what diffusion models are, how they work, how they allow Dolly two to do more than just image generation, also things like in-painting and blending between multiple images, how it's able to create much higher resolution images than the original Dolly, and a lot of other key info about how this all works. So let's get into that. As I was mentioning earlier, the training after clip can mainly be broken down into two parts. The prior generation, this is going from text embedding to image embedding, or the image prior. Then after that, there's the decoder, which converts the prior into, well, an actual image. Now, you might be asking, why is this first step generating a prior even necessary? At least that's what I was wondering when I first read this. Because we are using clip and the text and images are embedded into the same semantic space, then why not just directly use the text embeddings and pass those to the decoder to generate our image? Essentially, I'm asking why we can't just cut out this middle part right here. And if we scroll way down here, we can actually see the results of an experiment where they tried doing just that with a scaled down model. On the bottom here, you can see texts of different prompts. Then from the top row and going downwards, we see the results when using different combinations of inputs. So the first row has inputs that are just caption tokens. Then the second row has inputs that are the caption tokens and the caption embeddings as encoded by clip. And then the third row here has the full input, which is the caption tokens, the caption embeddings, and the image embeddings. So just looking at this, you can see that as you go further towards the bottom and you have these image embedding inputs in addition to just the text, this gets much better. So for example, in the second column where the prompt is an oil painting of a corgi wearing a party hat, you can see with just the text tokens, we get some woman. Um, and then as we add the text embeddings, we get something a little bit better. And then once we add the image embeddings, we get something much better. And you can see that this is a trend throughout all of these. You can see that adding the image embeddings clearly works better, hence why the prior step is important. But wait, the model used to produce these results was trained with image embeddings 95% of the time. So of course, it's going to be bad when you remove them and just pass in the text, right? If the model was trained with images and then you take away the images for testing time, well, that's not really fair, is it? In other words, their evidence for the necessity of this middle prior generation step is really bad. It might not even be necessary. Nevertheless, they do it, so we will briefly talk about it. I just wanted to get that rant out of the way because, oh my gosh, this was really bothering me. Anyway, let's get back on track now. Remember, we have two steps, the prior generation step and the decoder step. Starting with the prior generation step, they try two things. First, an autoregressive model, which is almost the same as what they do in Dolly 1. Given a text image pair, you use a transformer to autoregressively predict the image embeddings given the caption tokens and embeddings. This probably does work a little bit better than how it did in Dolly 1 though, because they are predicting based off clip embeddings instead of just raw text tokens. The second method they try is what they call a diffusion prior. I'll give a little bit more info on this one in a second. For the moment though, let's go ahead and jump on to the decoder. As I mentioned earlier, it uses a diffusion model. So how does that work? Well, it works on this idea of diffusion in the sense of adding noise. So imagine you start with an image at time step zero, then bit by bit at each time step, you add some Gaussian noise to the image. Well, by the time you get to the end of this process, after many steps, the image will be completely unrecognizable. There's no going back. However, if I were instead to ask you to reverse the noise after just a single step, 
you might be able to do it. And that is essentially the idea behind these diffusion models. We start with noise and we try to learn a model that undoes the noise one step at a time. So that's how the decoder works. And it's also how the second method of generating priors works that I skipped over earlier. If you really want to get your feet wet with the math and all of it, I'm no expert on this. So I'll link a wonderful video about this topic in the description. So those are the three steps to how Dolly 2 works. Training with clip for text and image embeddings, using the embeddings generated by clip to learn to generate image priors, and finally, using a diffusion model to convert the image prior into an actual image. One of the nice properties about these models is how they are able to generate a large number of differing outputs from a single input, which I think is a consequence of the randomness of, well, trying to denoise an image. Here you can see some of the variations of images that were embedded with clip. So the starting point for all of these images was the same, these two images right here. But then the embedding was decoded with that diffusion model over multiple different runs. The semantic information is preserved beautifully as you can see, but the images are still very diverse. Diffusion models also allow you to do things like this. Here what you see on the left and the right are two separate images. Those images were encoded with clip, the generated embeddings were interpolated, then passed through the decoder, and what you can see is you get an interpolation between different images, a very smooth transition from one image to the other. Similarly, the exact same thing can be shown when interpolating between two text embeddings. For example, here they're going from a photo of a cat to an anime drawing of a Super Saiyan cat. It's not like things similar to this haven't been done before, but this seems to work so well it reminds me of the rise of text embeddings and how amazed I was when I saw how you could add or subtract words to get new semantically equivalent words. For example, there's that one example that everyone knows where you essentially subtract man from king and then add woman and and then the nearest word embedding is queen. This seems to be a very similar thing to that. Skipping down a bit, I also thought that this experiment was very neat. Here, they're essentially limiting the dimension of the image embeddings on the left, and then allowing for higher dimensional embeddings further to the right. And then all the way on the right, you have the actual original images. What's really neat is you can see that on the left where the memory of the model is limited, it chooses to remember only the high level ideas, like the fact that it's looking at food or a city or a field. Then as more memory is allowed on the right, space for more detail is allowed, like the type of food, as you can see this turns into tomatoes, which is actually correct, or the layout of the city and the existence and the positioning of these cows. For the last few points here, we'll do a little bit of a speed run. In table one, we can see a human preference study was done between the two methods of generating priors, the autoregressive and diffusion methods. The diffusion-based methods were more diverse, but otherwise there were no statistically significant differences. In these figures, we can see some mistakes that the model often makes. Here, the upper images are being encoded, and then on the bottom, we see an array of several different decodings of the original encoded image. With the cubes, we can see that sometimes the model mixes up the positions of the cubes in the decoded images, putting the blue one on top instead of the red one. And with the corgi, we can see that it sometimes mixes up the colors of the party hat and the bow tie. Although these are mistakes, I actually think they're a pretty cool kind of mistake because it is just another example showing how the model likely distinguishes different objects at an abstract level and assigns them properties like colors, though sometimes it does mess up the assignment of those properties as we can see here. Below that, we can see another type of mistake the model often makes. When asking the model to show text, it can't quite display the right text, though notably it does at least show real letters, which most previous models have struggled with. That wraps up most of the key points in this paper. Before we take a look at some more examples that have been getting posted to Twitter recently, let's talk about my thoughts on this paper. First, from a research perspective, understanding how these types of generative models work and how we can improve them. And honestly, there isn't much here. There is some level of contribution here specifically around how to train these types of models, but really this work is not proposing any new ideas as far as I'm aware, nor is it running any solid tests or ablations on anything significant that wasn't already known before. While I'm not an expert in this area and could have easily been overlooking things, I just don't see much contribution on the research side of things here. Next, from an engineering perspective. Training big models like this, in the case this model had 3.5 billion parameters, well, that's always something that's somewhat impressive. That being said, the paper really only talks about this for like a page in the appendix, so 
meh, I guess. And finally, from a business perspective, well, that is where this work really shines. These images are high enough fidelity that I could imagine using them in something like these YouTube videos. I forgot to mention, not only can this generate images, it can also upscale them to 1024 by 1024, which is quite impressive. It sure would be nice to just generate a copyright-free image of anything I need. I would absolutely pay for a type of service like that if, well, it was affordable enough. The issue is, I don't know how expensive it is to generate these images. At the very least, this is definitely a huge PR win for OpenAI. So those are my thoughts. Let me know if you agree or disagree with them. Maybe there's some hot takes. <laughs> But with that out of the way, I want to look to Twitter now to take a look at some of the newly generated Dolly 2 images just for a little bit of fun. Unfortunately, I didn't get access to Dolly 2, at least not yet. So I'm going to have to be satisfied with this for now. A 1960s yearbook photo with animals dressed as humans. Jesus. <laughs> Wait, this is a curse. It's called Curse Dolly 2. That's this entire Twitter page. Wait, this looks so real. This isn't real, right? It looks like there's some weird stuff going on in the background. Oh, no. Oh, this caption. A group of yellow minions presenting talk on stage about their AI research at NeurUPS. Who is thinking of these captions? Okay, this one's actually pretty cool. Pikachu tile art, I'll take it. Oh God, we have Curse SpongeBob. Oh wow, this one's crazy. Now this, this is really neat. This is like legitimately art. I mean, I'm no art aficionado, but this looks pretty good to me. I wonder if all the shadows and stuff, right? This is very much like quality level that I would actually buy. <laughs> this is great. Oh my gosh, Steampunk Downtown Skyline. This is crazy. I love the ones like this. You can see there is some weird funky stuff going on in the right here, but dang, again, I just love these landscape photos it makes in this art style you can see it has a very distinct art style i know it can do other styles i think it's when they say like digital art that it does this type of style it is really interesting to see what you can do with prompt engineering and how the types of little things you add really affects the end result okay wait what's with its leg okay how i feel about mondays incredible i also have not eaten in like several hours and i am now very hungry vaporwave nature pixel art very simple prompt but this is really neat. A hot dog in the style of a Renaissance painting. You gotta, you gotta think like someone is just at their desk thinking of these prompts. And these people are absolute madmen. Oh God. Oh Jesus. This, this caught me off guard for a second. So this is not an actual Dolly 2 thing. <laughs> I wish it was. This would be incredible. Anyway, I hope you've all enjoyed this and learned something new. If you have and you like this type of content, consider subscribing. It really does help out. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and I hope to catch you next time.